very uh, intuitive, very easy to use. In the beginning, I was skeptical. I was like, I don't know if I need it or do I need it. I'll tell anybody, you need it. Workies. 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 Online bookings for us are huge using Workies. When a customer books, we get all the information, we get a ping to our phone, and then we can um, add it to the schedule and take care of that customer. Doing my research, you know, I was looking at software, um, you know, that was all inclusive, you know, invoicing, estimating, and it's been awesome. It keeps everything in track, people's names, addresses, whatever, you need it. It's helpful, especially now that we're a multi-truck operation, and as we get bigger, a lot of the Workies benefits become more pronounced. You couldn't do it without it. You'd be losing emails, you'd be losing addresses, Addresses, you know, like I could work off this now and have everybody's name and address. I could send them Christmas cards. I could send them holiday, whatever. We have call recording turned on, so when our techs give the customer a call when they're 20 minutes away, we can listen in on those calls. Um, we see when the truck arrives. We can catch photos for the job of how it goes. It's also our CRM, so when we want to send out email marketing, we have that list straight from Workies um, to export, and then we can reach all our customers easily. It's your contact list. That's not over here, over here, over here. No, it's right here all the time. What's up everybody? Hey, 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 it is Lee Godbold with Junk Removal Authority where we help junk removal business owners make more money and live a better life. This is part of our Workies or a JRA webinar series sponsored by Workies, which we've got another one coming up next Wednesday. Is that right? Wednesday, yes. three o'clock PM. Mm -hmm. Next Wednesday, three o'clock PM Eastern time. That is, what's that, the 15th? Mm -hmm. That is November 15th. And that one is going to be on kind of some of the similarities and differences and on, on SEO and Google Ads. So we're going to be going into some search engine optimization, why that's important, and what are some of the things that we can do to rank well in SEO. Some stuff on Google Ads and kind of how the two of them work together and help you kind of prop up your overall business that you receive from Google. So today is, uh, it's open Q&A. Anything you guys want to talk about, feel free to stick in those comment sections. If you want to register for that webinar for next uh, Wednesday, there will be a link in the comments as well that Matt's going to stick in there. And uh, so we've got open Q&A today, and then we're going to go over some Google Ads accounts. We've got a, one or two that have been submitted that I want to take a look at. We're going to kind of dive in. i got a couple also little points that have come up over the past week or two when we have been auditing some other people's accounts that switched over to us. So I want to jump right into that. So we're going to cover Google Ads stuff today, but if you've got any questions, feel free to post them in the comments. All right. Somebody came to us out west and or on the Midwest and had an issue with one of their campaigns where all of a sudden their with their previous management company, their volume had just reduced a ton. Now it sort of lined up when things overall slowed down. So at first they're kind of thinking, hey, maybe this is just the general slowdown, but they got so slow that it was just very, very unusual and they were way off. Instead of being like 20% off, which a lot of companies that are established are 20% off, they were like 40% off. So they're almost double the decrease. And they have a pretty healthy budget. One thing they noticed is their budget, which was $350 a day, they were barely spending like $175 a day, $150, $175, whereas before they would always spend about $350. So one of the issues that we've got here is obviously they weren't spending their budget. The other thing was, is when they came to us, we looked to see what they did last year at this time, and their impression, the number of impressions was way down. But the impression share percentage was actually pretty, pretty good. So for the number of searches they were eligible to show for, they actually had a higher impression share percentage than they did last year, but they had overall less impressions. So something seemed to sort of off here. And one of the very first things that we did is we popped over into negative keywords. So negative keywords, that is one of the things you need to be doing on a weekly basis. When you first launch an account, you should do it a few, you know, a couple times a week. Uh, you know, after, depending on how many negative keywords you start out with your campaign, after a month or so, you can reduce that down to about once a week, unless you have a really high budget. So if you have budgets of like, even 350 is pretty high. So like $300 or $250, $300 a day plus, probably need to be getting in there a couple times a week to look at your uh, negative keywords. But 
You go through your search terms, you add negative keywords, you tell Google, hey, I don't want to show for this set of keywords that I just added. And that keeps you from potentially wasting money on bad search terms. The other thing it does is over time, your click-through rate on your campaign goes up. The higher the click-through rate, the better overall quality the campaign is, and Google will start rewarding you with a higher quality score on your keywords, which is going to lead you to have to spend, be able to spend less for a given ranking. So it's very, very important. What had happened here when we did some digging is the main keyword junk removal and then their main city had actually been that added as a negative keyword. And I'm sure it was by mistake. But these are some of the little things that can trip up a Google Ads campaign and can take a campaign that's been performing well and all of a sudden it doesn't perform well at all and it can start also wasting a lot of money. So there are little things that really trip up, can trip up a Google ad campaign. This is one of the most common. So if you ever have an issue where volume just disappears, check negative keywords. All right, so that is something that within the last week we encountered on somebody else's campaign. They ultimately wound up switching over after we found that. They did switch over to us. They had used us in the past. So they used us like two years ago. They used us for about a year, decided they were gonna try somebody else out. Person did pretty well, made a mistake though, that wound up costing them a decent amount of money. They decided they wanted to switch back to us. So the volume, if the volume disappears, check negative keywords. That's one of the most common things. The other thing, this was a big issue last year. And we looked at another campaign last week and they had Google search partners turned on. So Google search partners is uh, something we used to run. It's sometime about August or so of last year, it all of a sudden started racking up really bad traffic. And what was essentially happening is for some reason, somebody was running an ad uh, for jobs. So they were saying, hey, there's a junk removal company. And I think it was they were willing to pay up to $100 an hour or something. And, the and it was typically in Spanish. So you're getting a lot of Spanish speaking people that were calling in asking for work because they had seen this ad, I think it was actually shown on Facebook, for like willing to spend up to $100 an hour. And we traced that, it, it, there was it was coming through Google Ads too, so people were racking up this high spend. It was killing cost per convert, well, the cost per conversions, the problem is it actually looked like the cost per conversion it was doing okay because um, it was getting counted as a conversion, but the problem is it was extremely unqualified. But we would look at the search terms and we're like, nowhere on here, like we've excluded, excluded junk removal jobs, junk removal hiring, junk removal gigs, like those were keywords we had already added as negative keywords to exclude because we don't want to show for those. So we got into d doing some digging. I don't even remember exactly how we found it. I, I think we went, we segmented the traffic between Google search and Google search partners. That's what it was. And all of a sudden we saw that the search partners had gone from being like 10% of the overall spend to being like 70% of the overall spend on some of these campaigns. And you're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars because of this one ad that was running. Never really figured out why anybody was running that particular ad. It still, I think it still is going on by the way. As a matter of fact, I know it is because we just encountered this. So uh, last week we looked at the campaign that had it turned on. It was the same thing. The guy, we went back and traced, it was probably something like $5,500 to $6,000 that had been wasted over like the last six months on going to Google search partners. And a lot of it was on this one job ad. He kept complaining, you know, I'm getting people calling up asking for work saying junk removal companies are paying $100 an hour. So I think what was occurring was a couple things. They were seeing the search partner stuff. They were clicking on it. And then they also were doing a search for junk removal companies on Google, and they might actually click on that ad too. So there's this huge kind of web of issues that was really going on that was wasting a lot of money. So you definitely, definitely, definitely want Google search partners off 
Do not run Google search partners. That is a huge way of wasting a ton of money on your Google ads campaign. All right, the next thing that came up recently, so I'm just kind of going over some scenarios as we manage Google ads campaigns and some stuff that might trip people up. So this is something that happens every once in a while. Google estimates top of page bid. So if they show way too high suggested top of page bid, so this would be like, what is way too high? Uh, probably definitely 25, a lot of times 21. Um, so 21 to 25 plus. Probably just want to ignore it. Um, and set it to something that's more realistic. It's generally not your main keyword. So it's normally not like junk removal and junk removal, whatever your city is. It's going to be some other keyword that is lower volume. And for some reason, it's telling you you need to spend like $38 per click. And this is if you're doing uh, manual CPC. So again, we generally start out a campaign. We start out with manual CPC, enhanced manual. And you'll sometimes see these really high suggested. What we found is oftentimes that is in an area that there's a lot of volume. So there might be a particular time of day, first thing in the morning before everybody's exhausted their budget, where you maybe won't show up top. But what happens is the people that are complying with that $37 cost per click and they're saying, yeah, I'll spend $37 because Google says that's what I need to spend. They disappear at by like 9.30, 10, 10.30 in the morning. And then all of a sudden your ad starts showing. So you have to realize, do some basic math and understand what your conversion rate is. So if you're generally getting a 25% conversion rate, that means one out of every four clicks is actually resulting in a phone call. You got to understand what your allowable acquisition cost is too. That's something we can actually talk about. If you understand what your allowable acquisition cost is and you understand your conversion rate is one out of four, and let's say you book 50% of those, which is really good. You're normally not going to book 50. It's normally going to be like 40-ish. But let's say you book 50% of those. That means you're going to have to, if it's at $30 a click, you're going to have to spend $120 to get one conversion. And of that, you're only going to book half of those. So you're going to have to get two conversions to get one job. And now all of a sudden you got a $240 into getting one job. The math doesn't math at that point. It's nobody's got a $240 allowable acquisition cost. Let's talk about allowable acquisition costs. This is a great subject. If any of you guys have ever watch Shark Tank, that's something they're always talking about, is what is your cost to acquire a customer? Um, they're all, so what is your customer acquisition cost? And what this is basically doing, what allowable acquisition cost is saying, is it's taking all of your expenses and it's saying, hey, this is what you could afford to spend on a customer and break even. And uh, now a lot of you guys, you know, we're not in business to break even. And what you can do is you can say, all right, my allowable acquisition cost is 150. Then I know I want to make at least $30 uh, of profit per Google ads job in the immediate. So I'm going to basically work to get that number down to 120. And what happens when you go from 150 to 120 is now you're telling Google you're willing to spend less for a conversion. So you generally wind up getting less conversions. That's one thing you have to keep in mind. There's definitely a balancing act between, there's a scale between uh, volume and profit. So this right here would be if, you're, if your acquisition cost and your allowable acquisition cost is basically about the same. But if you want to increase profit, so if you want profit to go up, then volume goes down, generally. Same thing with volume up, profit goes down. So this thing is definitely, it's a sliding scale as to whatever you want to accomplish. Allowable acquisition cost. That's AAS, AAC, excuse me, is basically the amount left 
to spend on acquiring a customer, on getting a customer. After all expenses are paid, after all other expenses are paid, So, what are some, most of your expenses on junk removal? I normally would have this written down, so I'm gonna try it. We'll kind of go through this entire process and see if I can remember. But all right, so you got fuel, you got labor, you got vehicle wear and tear, repair bills, whatever you want to call it, disposal fees. Uh, you got some insurance. Insurance, you're just going to do a percentage. So go through your kind of your P and L and say, all right, you know, if I look at my P and L statement, I'm spending two percent on insurance, three percent on insurance, whatever it is. You're going to add that in there. Remember, on labor, you need to include all of your payroll taxes and all that kind of stuff. All right, let me think through the job process here. So we got the fuel to get to the job. We got the labor time to actually do it. We got disposal to get rid of it. We got wear and tear on the actual truck. We've got insurance to rotate stuff around these are going to be your main expenses i know i know i'm missing some like there's more than this but these are going to be your main expenses like typically fuel is going to be like four percent five percent labor 25 percent 20 25 wear and tear uh could be around two percent three percent depending on the age of your fleet disposal fees normally anywhere from seven to twelve percent depending on the disposal rates that you have and insurance can vary depending on how long you've been in business so you understand these numbers and then you say, all right, all this basically adds up to, let's say this adds up to $400, which for most areas of the country is high. Matter of fact, let's not even do 400. That's so, that's so high. Uh, let's say it's 250. 250, 300 is probably more with what's normal. All right, so 250. All right, now you got to know your average job sale. So let's say 250 is average expense in this made up situation, you have to understand your own numbers. And let's say your average job sales 400. AJS, you guys should know what AJS is. I talk about it often enough. So $400 average job sale. So you have a $150 allowable acquisition cost. So that means right there, you can spend up to $150 to acquire a customer. So now you gotta, you gotta notice a couple more numbers. One other number you need to understand is uh, conversion rate. Matter of fact, let's write this up here a little bit. So what is conversion rate? Conversion rate is out of all the clicks that actually land on your website, what is the per percentage that actually wind up contacting you? Now, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. JRA is an agency that only tracks like legitimate conversions. There are a lot of companies out there that don't. So the conversions that we're tracking that we track is phone call, form submittal, online booking. These are the conversions we track. If you have text messaging set up, we can track text messaging also through call rail. All right, uh, other companies, they might throw in, somebody clicked on your Facebook page, they clicked on directions to your location, uh, they just did some sort of website page visit, like they'll, they'll inflate that because most junk removal business owners uh, or business owners in general, when they're trying to compare companies, they're gonna look at, all right, profit basically, which cost per conversion is a lot of what your profit is. And if all of a sudden, you know, you go off and you get somebody to look at your digital marketing and compare it, which current agency is doing compared to whatever this other agencies they're looking at your stuff. One of the first things they're gonna say is, oh, you know, immediately we can decrease your cost per conversion by 25%. What they're not telling you is they go in there and they add in these BS conversions and that completely changes the picture. You're no longer comparing apples to apples, you're comparing apples to oranges or you know, whatever. And that's, uh, so basically when, when people get audits of campaigns, like if you want me to audit your campaign, 
if I want to, I can make your campaign seem like it's the worst thing in the world and it can be awesome. And unless you guys have been like watching these webinar shows and kind of uh, going through and doing some of your research, you're going to not really understand or know. Now we have, I can count, uh, I can't, I cannot count on two on both my hands. The number of campaigns we looked at and we said, Hey, you know what? You're doing a good job on your campaign. Your budget's not high enough for us to really, you know, uh, be advantageous to switch over to us. Your company you're using, you know what? They're doing pretty well. You know, like there, there have been quite a few instances where we go about it the honest way and we say, Hey, you're not going to be able to, uh, reach, you're not going to do enough, enough better to justify our cost with how you're currently doing. Cause you're doing a pretty damn good job. And, uh, then the, most of the campaigns we look at though, like we do find legitimate issues. So that's one thing with us. Like we look at your campaign, we're, we're not, we're going to shoot you straight. Uh, but other agencies out there, like they might feed you some BS. There's good agencies out there. There's bad ones. And the problem is, is you really don't know which is which unless you educate yourself. And that's one of the reasons we started this, doing this uh, Google ads, uh, podcast here. We do have a question. All right. Let me, uh, I tell you what, give me one second. Let me finish my train of thought here and then we'll, 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 we'll knock that out. So cost per conversion. I'm sorry. We need a cost per conversion. We don't, is important, but a conversion rate. Again, that's a percentage of clicks that contact you. And then uh, cost per conversion. Amount you spend for a content for a conversion. And then your phone closing rate or phone booking rate. Percentage of calls that you schedule. So basically like if you know these numbers right here, uh, if you know your conversion rate, let's say it's uh, conversion rate, let's say it's 25%. Cost per conversion, let's say is $50. Uh, booking rate, let's say you're booking at 50% here. Now again, you're not normally gonna be at 50%. Some people are, but a lot of them are like 40-ish. Uh, it's, it's pretty common. Now you just gotta, you gotta do some math here. So all right, we know Conversion rate, we're converting one out of four. Our cost per conversion is $50. That would mean our, call, uh, our overall cost per job, $200 advertising cost per job or cost acquire customer. That's what you would normally call that. Uh, that's, that's where you're going to be on just the, uh, hold on a second here guys, let's see. Fifty and a hundred. Okay, yeah, here we are. So no cost per conversion. I'm I'm think I'm getting confusing here with cost per click. Cost per conversion is fifty dollars, and let's say we book half of those, then a hundred dollars is going to be your cost per job at that point. One hundred dollars cost to acquire a customer. I was about to say something's not adding up here. Uh, customer acquisition cost. So you go through all of your expenses, you add everything up. You saw that you had a two hundred fifty dollar allowable acquisition cost. We got a pretty nice scenario going on right here. So, cause you got $150 per job that you would be profiting in that particular scenario, which is uh, honestly pretty good for Google ads. Um, but it's normally, we do have a lot of customers who get fifties. Like I still think a $50 cost per conversion on average in Google ads is doable. There's some areas that are going to be up in the sixties. If you want to get really aggressive on volume, you might be more than that. Some areas will be a little less, but that's a nice little average round number. This is normally going to be a little bit less. So normally like we're seeing customer acquisition cost generally in like the 150 range ish for most customers on Google ads. And as it is, that's actually a pretty wide variation. Some people are at hundred, some people are at 200, 220. Um, it's all a matter of knowing what your acquisition cost is to know, to understand what you can afford to spend. Some areas are just more expensive. That's one thing to keep in mind, no matter how good you are at managing campaign, your area, if it's super competitive, if you've got people willing to spend a lot of money, you're not going to get the same results in San Francisco that you might get in Huntsville, Alabama or Knoxville, Tennessee. It's just, it's a, it's a different market. And sometimes Knoxville, you get a couple guys that are like super aggressive and there's less volume. They can get expensive too. They don't normally stay there, but I mean, the stuff can. And so there's definitely like 
your results, what you do, you, it's, it's a changing game all the time because you have different competitors coming in. You have to really stay on top of it. What we got question wise there, Matt? So we have a question from Alberto Anaya. He says, me and my wife own Trinity Junk and we've been having bad experiences with Google Ads. Yep. We're trying to get it dialed in, but every marketer that we have hired has cost us thousands. Yeah, you know, I hate to say it. Um, Google Ads, you know, one of the things I said, I think it was last week, it was something I just kind of came up randomly, is uh, Google Ads suck, sucks. We try and help it suck a little bit less. So there are advertising agencies that completely run the gambit from really, really good and really expensive to really, really bad and cheap or really, really bad and also expensive. I mean, they're all, they're all over the place. Uh, when they, you know, it might be a few that are really good and inexpensive, but then they realize they start charging more eventually. So that might be somebody that's new that knows what they're doing, but they're really small. And all of a sudden they've realized, hey, I've got to charge more or otherwise I'm limited to the number of clients that I can actually take on. So Alberto, to answer your question, it, uh, uh, without looking at your campaign, I can't tell you one way or the other if you're on the right track or not. What I can say is nowadays when we launch Google Ads campaigns, sometimes you go a few weeks without getting much at all. Uh, and you might spend a fair amount of money. So there's a lot of like calibration that has to go on for a particular market condition, a particular website, uh, a particular campaign. So I tell a lot of people, it's like, guys, you know, generally the first 30 days, it's not all that great. Hopefully by the end of 30 days, you're seeing some sort of like positive momentum and things sort of picking up. <clears throat> Into 60 days, hopefully you're starting to feel a little bit better about stuff. You're like, all right, this is kind of working. Into 90 days, now we're feeling pretty good. But that's if you're working with an honest agency that knows what they're doing, that's making sure that they're taking care of the stuff as is needed. And you've got, if, if, you've, if you're sure you're working with a good agency that's got a good reputation, you gotta give them some time nowadays. It used to be five years ago, we could fire up an ads campaign, throw in our keywords, throw in our ads, throw in our negative keywords, uh, stick in the uh, location, stick in the customer's credit card, and then just things just went well. About three years ago, that got to be a little harder. And then this year, it is, it's, it's just, it's a different game, a completely different game than it was 365 days ago. Uh, we've seen some people have been doing Google Ads for a while that have completely stopped doing it. I don't want to scare people away from Google Ads, but I want people to understand this, it, you know, this is definitely a, a pretty big monetary commitment. You need to be in a pretty good shape to be able to get started with it. And you've got to stay patient. If you're sure you're working with a good company or if you know your stuff, uh, you've gone through and you've kind of learned, then you've got to stay patient on working the numbers and tweaking it and letting Google learn your campaign and let you work what area, learn what areas work best, what bids you need to be at, what bidding strategies you need to be at, what ad copy really works for your area. So there's, there's a lot that goes in it. Um, one thing I will tell you, smart campaigns, don't do smart, uh, don't do a, not a smart campaign, but like, um, it used to be called smart we like smart bidding and, or automated bidding strategies, but I think it's called don't do, I think it's smart campaigns now. So when you first set it up, Google is gonna try and get you to do a smart campaign. And uh, you, it's like you have to like click a button that's not very completely honest. It's like advanced settings or whatever to actually do a, like more of a manual uh, campaign. And that's what you wanna do, because otherwise if you do a smart campaign, Google's just gonna do whatever the heck it thinks it wants to do with very little guidance that you're actually able to provide. And generally it's not good results. It's bad, bad results. So that's one thing to make sure you're looking at there. Uh, I wish I could answer a little bit more of your questions, Alberto, on how to make it good or better. But without looking at it, it's really tough to do. Cool. All right, so I got a campaign here. And I, I normally like looking at these campaigns before I actually jump in and cover one on a show, but it was just provided to me uh, like 30, or I mean, I think it was 15 minutes before I started the show, it was sent through. So you're gonna have to kind of allow me to go through this. All right, the first thing I'm gonna look at is what's this guy willing to spend? He's got an awesome budget. He's willing to spend 9.65 a day By the way, just so you guys know, because um, when you're first starting out, this is hard, it's hard to fathom these types of numbers, but 965, I'm assuming he's showing for 30 days. I haven't looked into that. Guys, that's, he's willing to spend 
28,950 a month. That is just about 30 grand a month. That is, just so you under, everybody kind of gets it, that's 347,000, 347, 400 per year. The majority of junk removal companies do not even have $347,400 a year in sales. This guy's spending it in advertising. So that's pretty daggone cool. There are a lot of companies that spend this. There are a lot of companies that make well over this in revenue. But the majority of junk removal companies, of the 15,000 that are out there, give or take several thousand, uh, most vast majority are not doing $347,000 in sales. This guy's spending it in a year in Google advertising. And I happen to know he also does other advertising as well. So his advertising spend is probably coming up on four fifty dollars to $500,000 a year because I know he's doing a little bit of radio, a little bit of TV also. So he's probably a half million dollars a year he's spending in advertising. So if he spends three forty seven four hundred, we hope that that would generate somewhere between roughly one point four million to three forty seven four hundred times six to basically two million in revenue. That's what we hope this this guy is going to get from his advertising. Uh, efforts. Now, you will not always get that in every market, depending on how long you've been in business as well. You might not actually realize this, but this is this is the overall goal that we've got. So you spend 347, 400, hopefully we're getting 1.4 million. One thing to always remember, the more, as a general rule, the higher your budget, the high E, let's see, let's change this to higher, higher your budget, better your your ROAS is. ROAS is return on ad spend. As a general rule, the higher your budget, the better your return on ad spend is up to a point. So the reason I say up to a point is because you can get to a point where your budget's so high that if you absolutely want to spend your budget, then you start <clears throat> showing for single item campaigns, maybe doing some competitor campaigns showing for jobs that you don't gross as much money and then it becomes the opposite happens so there's a there's kind of a scale on it and you know it's gonna you're gonna kind of go up and then it starts kind of peaking off and at some point you're probably just not gonna be able to spend your to spend your budget so basically right here this is if your budget's low and then this is a higher budget. So let's say, let's say this is $50 a day. This is $100 a day. 150, 200, 250, 300, 350. And, and these numbers are probably, this should actually probably be something like 50, 200, 300, 500, you know, so it needs to be, these numbers should be a little bit higher. But what happens is, all right, when you're only going to spend $50 a day, it's hard to get a positive return on ad spend. Uh, not impossible, but difficult because one of the main reasons is no matter if you install click fraud software, Alberto, one thing, make sure you're using click cease or some sort of click fraud software. There is always going to be an element of click fraud. And Google does exclude some of that on its own. But let's think about this, guys. What benefit is it to Google to prevent click fraud? And again, what is click fraud? Click fraud is when your competitors are clicking on your ads, essentially trying to run up your cost or potentially trying to scare you off. So this is really common if it's a brand new campaign, like every competitor out there, or a lot of them, every device they have, they're gonna click on your ad. They're going to get their friends and family to do it. They're going to get their employees to do it. 
And essentially what they're trying to do is right when you first launch, they want to scare you off. They don't want you doing Google ads at all. So there's all, when you first start, click fraud is normally pretty high. By using a click fraud software, which click sees is a relatively inexpensive one that's pretty good. There are ones out there that are a lot better, but you're going to spend a lot more money on it. Basically what click sees is doing is it, is it allows you to set a limit and say, hey, allow X number of clicks within X number of days. And if any IP address exceeds that, block that IP address. And Google only allows a certain number of records to block. I think it's 500. It could be a little bit more than that. But so like at some point, it will show the ad again. But uh, normally, once people realize, hey, you're showing, you're hanging around, you're not getting scared off, they back off the click fraud and we see the numbers start going down. So really high numbers when you first start, less so later on. But no matter what, you're always going to get some. And if you're spending, let's say a cost per click of $15, which is a pretty common cost per click now, we see ranges normally between $8 and $17 on manual. If you're on target CPA, you can see higher. But let's say it's $15. Basically, you're allowed like just over three clicks and you're gone. No longer showing. You're probably going to get at least three clicks a day from competitors. So that's why a 50, one of the main reasons a $50 a day budget just doesn't really work anymore. Once you get to 100, all right, you spent 45 on click fraud, now you get to 100. And all right, so now we've actually got some wiggle room where we can make a little money here. And then as you can see, that helps. But the other thing that happens is it allows more people to come in. And your chance of finding a good, high quality customer goes up. So that's the other thing that happens. The other thing that happens is the more you spend, the more data we get in. So the quicker your agency is actually able to make changes to improve your overall campaign, and the quicker Google is able to gather information for us to be able to use a campaign like Max Conversions Target CPA, which again, that is where Google dynamically changes the bids on individual searchers based upon how likely they are to convert. More likely to convert, it goes up, less likely it goes down. So all of this is to your benefit to the point, whatever this is, and again, this number is probably more like in most markets, decent sized markets, let's say it's on average 500 bucks. It could be a thousand. In a smaller market, it could be 250. But let's say this is your peak. So this is basically where we can run our most efficient campaign. We don't show for single item keywords. We don't show for competitors. <clears throat> we don't show in areas that are really far away from your location, where we show to like the most affluent areas where you're getting most of your work and people can actually afford to pay you. Once we get to that point where you like max your volume out, but you're like, hey, I want more volume. I want to gain more market share. Then you just got to start getting creative. So like right here, you're like real efficient. And then as you work down here, you become less efficient, which is again, single items. We're going to try and conquest competitors, so competitors far further or less desirable areas. Etc. Now, sometimes when people get to this point, they want more volume, they'll add more services, then maybe they'll start doing more interior demolition or more like demolition work. And then this scale changes, like this threshold goes way up and then it you know, starts going that down because your demo jobs are going to be a higher average ticket. And generally uh, even interior demo, for those of you guys that can do interior demo well, like you can be 50% growth, you know, profit margins on it. And uh, it's normally not a very com extremely competitive keyword, which is normally why I don't talk about interior demo work very much because um, 
we've got some companies that do it that do really, really well. It's something that I just don't normally speak on that much because they've got this like a little niche. So we we'll probably just change that around a little bit. But it's just how, whatever you want. If you want more volume, you're either gonna have to add more services, add less efficient keywords, whatever you want. So there's definitely this scale where profitability changes based on how much volume you want. All right, so he's got 965 a day in spend. He's got a cost per conversion of 5661. And by the way, in the last seven days, uh, last seven days, this is interesting. Last seven days, he's actually only spent about $1,400. So even though he's willing to spend this $347,400, he's basically got a budget so high that he's never not going to show. But he's only going to spend like five or six grand in a year. Um, which is not necessarily good. So if we roll in here, let's write a few more of his numbers down. Because now, I'm, uh, he's, uh, immediately I'm seeing opportunity now because of this, like, he's willing to spend so much money, but he's nowhere really near spending that amount. And the market this guy's in, like, it's an awesome junk removal market. I mean, it's, 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 it's a sweet market. It's a hell of a lot better than Raleigh. All right, so not in Raleigh and Charlotte and, and Lane. I mean, lane has got a lot of volume, but this market's sweet. It's awesome. All right, so if we look at this, uh, Campaign. I'm just gonna look at the junk removal campaign. The junk removal campaign itself, it's interesting how this campaign's set up. So the junk removal campaign itself is willing to spend $325 a day. But he's willing to spend $275 on single item pickups, which is kind of weird. $25 on demo, $60 on cleanouts. The budget allocation is just kind of off here. It's interesting. Let's, let's dive into junk removal. We don't have all day. Um, so junk removal has spent a thousand five. So his budgets for the junk removal campaign is 325. That is uh, 2275 a week. And basically ninety-seven fifty a month. So last seven days he has spent a thousand dollars a thousand five dollars. I'm gonna put he spent a thousand. So if you look, it's basically four weeks in a month. He's not even spending half his budget. Thousand dollars less seven days. Average CPC in nine seventy seven. And th these are the numbers I was really curious about. So forty percent impression share numbers. He has a forty percent overall impression share. Twenty five top. Or 12 absolute top. And then the next thing I'm curious about, which I'm, it can't be budget, it's gotta be rank on why he's missing out so much on impression share. He's missing out 73%, 73% impression share, lost due to rank. Zero percent lost due to budget. And he has an awesome, awesome, awesome cost per conversion of 56.61 for his market. This is awesome. Especially since he's running these single item. Well, single item campaigns can have a decent cost per conversion. He's not spending a ton on that, even though he's willing to. So <clears throat> I know we're running up on time here, but what I like about this campaign is like I can instantly look at this and say, hey, this guy wants to get more volume. If he actually wants to spend his budget here, then we just hop in there and we raise up the target CPAs and that's gonna bring the impression share up and bring his volume up. Understanding his cost per conversion is probably gonna go up. 
So it's basically, what is this goal? Does he actually want to spend $9,750 a month or did he just set that so high that basically he'd be willing to spend it if he could keep the cost per conversion in line? So I'd have to talk to this individual and figure out what their goals are. Uh, if he wants to maximize profit, which I think this guy's been open like seven years, something like that, seven, eight years. Junk doctors are the same way, guys. Like we get, we know what we want to spend. We go back to allowable acquisition costs. Like our allowable acquisition cost uh, is good because we have a good, we have, you know, we watch our expenses pretty closely and we've got a good average job sale. Uh, but we're, you know, we want to profit we want our profit margins to be a certain amount. I mean, our net profit margins we shoot for, net owner benefit is basically 20% every single year. And that that is with me drawing a bit of a salary without uh, without really doing anything uh, and looking at some reports. Christian draws a pretty daggone good good salary, and he does a fair amount, but, it does, you know, again, he, can go, he went off a vacation. He went to Denver um, about a month ago and played golf for, I think, five days or whatever like that. And there were people in place to make sure things kept running. So we've got like kind of multiple layers here. So I've got somebody that over, you know, my partner in Christian that overlooks everything on junk doctors. And he's even got people underneath him. So like we're really sort of doubling up. We're creating additional layers, but you know, uh, it's worth a certain amount of money to have that flexibility and kind of the, the redundancy in place. Which we've uh, which we've definitely got with that particular company because basically at this point with junk doctors I'm just like an investor, and, uh, and you know it's getting pretty much completely run uh, everywhere else and we've even set it up where Christian can have some nice flexibility as well which is great. We got a question. Garrett Wheeler, uh, he says, how do I figure out what my maximum CPC bid limit is? Well, if I'm trying to understand exactly what the particular question here is. All right, so max CPC, I mean, you can go in and there is a setting. If you go into um, key, your keyword bidding or ad group bidding or whatever, there's actually a, I'll tell you exactly, it's like on the left-hand corner and you can, so if you select a particular keyword, so, you know, you got your check boxes and if you click one of the check boxes or all of them or whatever and you go to edit, this is under the keyword tab. You can go down to change max CPC bids. And then there is a option to select raise bids to first page CPC or raise bids to top of page CPC. So top of page is again, again that's gonna be setting where you are gonna show within the top results. Uh, first page is you could be on the bottom, but you'll at least be on the first page. So. Sometimes when you start a campaign, you're gonna go down there and you're gonna select raise bids. And this is what we do. We go to raise bids to top of page CPC. And in our case, we sit there and we look at it and we're like, all right, if it pops up $9.77 and this guy's willing to spend $2.50, on a brand new campaign, we might set it at $15 and then we can work our way down. Um, sometimes you're, it's gonna pop up and it's gonna be like really high. And we're like, ah, this doesn't make all that much sense. And then we have a decision to make based upon how high the person's budget is. If they have a high budget, we still might spend it. That way we get good data in, it shows, and then we start working it down. Or we can say, hey, this person's budget is not very high. We can't afford to spend $20 a click uh, if their budget is $100 a day because they're only allowed five clicks. So we're going to back this down to 15 and just kind of see what happens. So it's a little bit of um, uh, kind of just trial and error. Um, for sure when you're setting it. Now, one of the things we were talking about earlier is you set a max CPC and all of a sudden Google throws up in red lettering. It gives you a alert that says basically you're below the top of page and you just spend X amount. Like sometimes it's crazy. It's like $42 or something like that. Like you're not gonna spend $42 for a click on manual CPC. Maybe when you get a target CPA, if you have an amazing conversion rate, you'll be willing to do that. But when you're doing manual CPC, you just can't be targeted enough. So uh, you're gonna wanna keep that down some. Most areas of the country start out at $15 CPC. Look at the results that you have coming in. Uh, the stuff you wanna watch is impression share. Top impression share, absolute top impression share. You'll look at your conversion rate too. So if you've got a conversion rate that's only like 8% and you look and your impression share percentages aren't great, like your top impression share is pretty low and it's telling you you're losing out due to rank, then you're gonna raise up your max CPC. But if you're looking at the numbers and you got an awesome 
max, or you got an awesome in top impression share percentage, let's say it's 80%, and your only reason you're, you're missing out 0% due to rank or, or 5% or even 10% due to rank, but you're missing out 60% due to budget, you're gonna wanna lower that max CPC down some. One thing you can do is Google is gonna show you what you're willing to spend on the max CPC, and then it's gonna show you what the average CPC is you're actually spending. So if the impression share numbers look pretty good, and let's say you're willing to spend $15 max CPC, but you notice that Google is only allowing you to, is only averaging a $14 average CPC, then you're like, hey, we can probably get away with cheaper click here. So normally I would lower it between five to 20%. I don't generally want to go over 20%. And on, man, on manual CPC, actually I try and limit it more like 10%. So if I look and we've been averaging $14 average CPC, I want to try and decrease my cost because the conversion rate and the search impression share numbers look good. Then I'm going to lower that max CPC basically a dollar forty from fourteen. So we're going to go from fourteen down to thirteen six no, down to twelve sixty, and give it about seven to fourteen days, depending on your budget. See what happens, and then kind of adjust again. So it's definitely a lot of trial and error. Fifteen is a great place to start if you're talking about a brand new campaign. Start it out at fifteen, see what happens, and uh, just kind of adjust from there. Any other questions? A couple of comments. Cool. Just wanted to shout out James from Junk 180. He said 965 a day. That's inspirational right there. And then uh, Alberto has been uh, commenting back and forth. He said, we're trying to scale. JRA is on point. And he said, thank you, JRA. So I just want to give him a shout out. Thanks, Alberto. Appreciate the comment, man. Appreciate you watching. So, yep, uh, 965 a day is definitely inspirational. Um, it's something that you, anybody in a decent market, you know, you should be working to. Your, your goal with Google, again, is to get your cost per conversion in a way, or, or really your cost per job. Your allowable, ac you need to be turning a profit. You know your allowable acquisition cost, your acquisition cost needs to be less than the allowable acquisition cost, and then you just increase your ad spend, and it just brings in more profits. Some markets are harder than others. James, you're in a difficult market. Um, not a bad market, but it's just a less profitable market, and it's one that you got to be a bit more attentive on Google Ads to kind of get some good results out of. I appreciate the comment, though. Great. All right, so we got 52 minutes out of this uh, particular episode. Hope you guys found it valuable. I think we covered some real neat stuff. Again, what was cool is this is stuff that has popped up over the last couple weeks, or last week, really, that I thought would be uh, something that would be good to share. It's stuff that we know but a lot of people really don't, uh, especially if you're kind of trying to learn this stuff yourself. I think everybody should be learning this also. Like if you run Google Ads, not everybody should self-manage, especially when you're willing to kind of spend more and you're busy and you got other stuff going on. But uh, you at least need to know how this stuff works and then you can kind of tell if the company you're working with is doing a good job or not. So, hey, we do this uh, pretty much every... Thursday, 12 noon Eastern time. We have another webinar coming up next Wednesday, 3 p.m. on SEO and Google Ads. So make sure you click the link in the comments or description. Get signed up for that webinar. It's part of the JRA webinar series presented by Workies. Workies has been an amazing partner to the junk removal industry over the past five, six years or so. Um, it is an awesome tool, a good price. It really allows you to know your numbers, to allow your team to get the jobs uh, kind of on time. There's nice communication. They've got phone uh, capabilities and text capabilities and it just really streamlines your entire job. It syncs over with QuickBooks with your accounting software so you can get, some, get your reports right with relative ease. Awesome, awesome, awesome partners. So make sure you check Workies out if you're not using them. We have a link in the description. And if, hey, we here at JRA can help you out with any of your digital marketing or needs or if you're needing a video training series to learn about the business or maybe train you guys up. Or if you're looking to get in business, we have a franchise alternative, don't go buy a franchise. We've got something for a lot less money and really no long-term commitment that you can jump in here and get the same great training results and all and uh, just have to spend a heck of a lot more money and actually own 100% of the business. So whatever we can do to help, head over to junkarray.com. Appreciate you guys watching this webinar. Make sure you subscribe to our channel if you like it and we'll plan on seeing you here again at uh, 3 p.m., I guess, next Wednesday, and then 12 noon on Eastern Time next Thursday. Catch you right here soon. Again, this is Lee Gobble, Junk Removal Authority, where we help junk removal business owners make more money and live a better life. See you next time. Very uh, intuitive, very easy to use. In the beginning, I was skeptical. I was like, I don't
Workies. 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 Online bookings for us are huge using Workies. When a customer books, we get all the information, we get a ping to our phone, and then we can um, add it to the schedule and take care of that customer. Doing my research, you know, I was looking at software, um, you know, that was all inclusive, you know, invoicing, estimating, and it's been awesome. It keeps everything in track. People A truck operation and as we get bigger a lot of the workies benefits become more pronounced you couldn't do it without it. you'd be losing emails you'd be losing addresses you know like i could work off this now and have everybody's name and address i could send them christmas cards i could send them holiday whatever we have call recording turned on so when our techs give the customer a call when they're 20 minutes away we can listen in on those calls um, we see when the truck arrives we can attach photos for the job of how it goes it's also our crm so when we want to send out email marketing we have that list straight from Workies um, to export, and then we can reach all our customers easily. It's your contact list. That's not over here, over here, over here. No, it's right here all the time.